read and how to count from 1 to 100. We all know that essentially primary school is used as a form of brainwashing by the state <laughs> and adults to teach kids how to behave in real life and later on in high school. And what we would argue on the affirmative side of the house today is that children in particular at very young ages are constantly forced to interact with pernicious anti-feminist ideas like the Madonna Hall co uh, complex that come out in almost every fairy tale you've ever had anything to do with where evil old crones are whoring themselves out for inheritance money and they're having to come up against virginal young maidens who inevitably need saving by Prince Charming. We on the affirmative do not stand for that shit. We think <laughs> that Beauty and the Beast should not be a tale about the kind of thing that people want to listen to. We think that things like Mulan, Chinese warrior princesses, are far more in the realm of stories that we would be telling the young children in the primary schools at the moment. We think Hansel and Gretel should not be a tale about a brother and a sister lost in the woods, but rather a tragic story, maybe a funny story, I don't know, about a fag and his fag hag lost in their sexuality. We think it's Charming, or, or fight against her horrible, crony old stepmother, she should be a free and independent lady running a successful house cleaning business. We think that's a great idea. So, what is our model in today's debate? There will be no unmarried spinsters or witches in our fairy tales. There will be no damsels in distress. There will be no Prince Charming. If there is a Prince Charming, you will be your gay best friend. There will be no evil stepmothers. There will be no father figures that also. Uh, coincidentally, the king of the realm. We think that once we've done the fairy tales and we've printed out these books, the other things that the children will be forced to interact with in these primary schools will be things like unisex bathrooms. There'll be cross-dressing dress-up time. There'll be school uniforms, but we're envisioning more something like jumpsuits or unitards. <laughs> There'll be no segregated school sports. Kids will play netball, whether they're boys or girls. Kids will play football. And if it happens organically that girls want to play netball and boys want to play football, no, we're going to say, you have to play football, this will be your dream, even if you really want to play netball. <laughs> we're happy to crush the dreams of children in the furtherance of making sure that reinforced gender roles that have, for hundreds of thousands, for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, dominated our cultural and social landscape, should be abominated, obliterated. <laughs> Essentially, our goal in today's debate is to create a world that Judith Butler would have designed herself. So, my, first, my two arguments in today's debate will firstly be why entrenched gender roles are bad, and secondly, why primary school is the particularly most effective place to target the problem. No. So, why entrenched gender roles are bad? I have three reasons. Firstly, they're inflexible. They're often put in a situation where they are diametrically opposing opposites, where boys and girls have particular stereotypes that are enforced upon them, and they don't get to choose that, which is my second problem, and I'll take you in a moment. You don't consent to these things, especially when they're so culturally pernicious that when you are born, your mother dresses you in pink if you're a girl and blue if you're a boy. You don't get to opt in to being a girly girl. You don't get to opt in to being a, boy, a, a kind of boyish boy. And if you do decide to go against the stream and, be, and become, for example, a tomboy, you are often bullied and divided in class at a young age because the kids in the class don't know any better. Yeah. Now, why is it okay to fix one perceived problem, but in the same vein, deny people the ability to like identify with something they feel safe, their gender? Because the reason they identify with that gender in the first place is that we've created a cultural construction that doesn't allow them to choose that in the first place. So, for example, I know an issue close to your heart, James, is homosexuality. <laughs> a lot of people deny their homosexuality because their culture enforces that upon them. And would you call that a choice, James? I don't think you would. So there are a lot of girls out there that are denying the fact that they want to be boyish in stereotype, but we shouldn't call it boyish. It should just be the kind of person that they want to be. It shouldn't be attached to a label that is particularly masculine or particularly feminine. That's why we have unisex bathrooms. So, third, we think that particularly in the instance where you do enforce gender roles, this is inextricably linked with sexuality, and therefore, most <coughs> of the time, gender norms that are enforced on children are heteronormative, and we think that this is particularly bad for young kids who have their sexual views formed at young ages, even if 
our parents don't want to know about it. They are formed at a young age and they inform the way we look at our sexuality for the rest of our life. But it means that kids who are struggling with their sexual identity in primary school and in the early years of high school have something forced upon them that they didn't get to consent to and also that is ruining their lives. But, but secondly, why primary schools in particular? It is for that formative reason that I have just highlighted. It is because when kids are young, they are stupid, and we can tell them anything and they'll believe it. And if we decide to change our cultural paradigm and tell kids that there's no such thing as a boy, there is no such thing as a girl, there is only such thing as a person who is an individual with their own identity that they can construct themselves and within the form of their society, we have a blank slate. And we think that that blank slate is particularly useful in primary schools. Particularly because when you look at the kinds of futures that these kids are looking at, often girls don't consider that they want to be a football star, or don't consider that they want to be a CEO of a major corporation, because that's not what they're taught to think. We want to change that, and we think we can do that most effectively in primary schools. Thank you. <laughs>
denigrate the legitimate life choice of the witch or the grandma makes in Hansel and Gretel to bake cakes all your life and say, lure your children into an oven. We think that like, <laughs> the, the fact that you can get a range of other show, uh, other things from like other um, forms of meat about what a uh, what a woman should be or a man should be, and the fact that all those kind of portrayals already exist, the fact that children's books already exist, like uh, uh, and Three Max Tango, which is a book about two gay penguins, we think that the fact that <laughs> already exists, where like the uh, woman will say this hopeless um, man who's stuck in the tower, like we think that the fact that these things already exist, and the fact that you can get alternatives to Hansel and Gretel, and the fact that they're pretty common, the fact that Disney now has a black princess, and it's come from the you know being very racist in the second part, is in fact progress. We don't think that like the res the response to this though needs to be to dismantle everything that we think is sexist or everything that we think enforces traditional gender role. We think like pluralism is good. Um, we more, like we just don't think that it's the role of government to be to socially engineer um, groups and society. So secondly, why we think gender roles are important. We think that what their system does is it makes children and therefore adults uncomfortable with acting in a way that is stereotypically male or stereotypically female. We think that it's fine if little girls want to dress up in pink and wear dresses and play with dolls and if boys want to have trucks. Obviously that's not what all of us enjoy doing, um, but it's what some of us did. So we think that we think that these things are particularly dear to some people. Um, and we think that, like, for starters, because there is just a simple biological link to um, gender, but also just because there's a broader social link to all kinds of things that are um, in gender, to a particular interest, the way people form friendships and things, um, we don't undermine this. I think, for example, that like a lot of things that a lot of religions do, and the way that identity is structured, is a particularly poor choice in some cases, but that doesn't mean that I think that schools should seek to actively undermine this. So thirdly, briefly, like gender role change be organic and things, um, we think that historically movements have only ever progressed when they have had to push things for themselves through protests and having to like pitch the case that there should be equality in society. We don't think we have ever got there when we've had to try and top down change by attempting to force a uh, perception of what society is onto schools. So overall, because we think neutrality is a much better option than subversion, we beg to apply. Substandard points. Firstly, there was school is about 
about neutrality. We didn't understand on the affirmative team how that really fell to the negative in this debate because you are neutral when you don't ram gender norms down people's throat. And I'd like an answer from that in the next yeah, message speech. You guys, your model is that you only have non-gender norm material. Our model is you have both. Why is it okay to shove the opposite down people's throats, but it's not okay to shove the current? Because one is in line with the predominant paradigm that's existed for thousands of years and is rammed down people's throats structurally when they enter the real world, so why can't we give them the ability to resist that structural enforcement in their identity at an early age? Let's deal with your other uh, arguments. Firstly, you told us about backlash. We don't give a shit about backlash. There's a greater good at this, uh, in this part of this debate. And then you told us that gender norms were not only a Western construct. That is exactly the point. That is why there is human rights legislation that goes out to give choice to women in patriarchal societies that get, emancipate them from the shackles of thousands of years of gender structures that condemn them to having only one type of identity. We stop that type of uh, exploitation at an international level. Why can't we stop it at an education level? Taking the tone of the debate down somewhat, I'm going to talk about, in my substantive material, sex and how this pr proposal actually affects children's, although obviously I mean when they grow up to be able to have sex, their perceptions of sex. What are the problems with fairy tales as it stands and how they affect sex? First of all, most of them are heteronormative, except this penguin thing, and even then, only animals are having gay sex. So, <laughs> riddle me that. Second, the prevailing paradigm in these fairy tales fairy tales is that a kiss is enough to substantiate a meaningful relationship. There's no getting to know one another, there's no sort of emotional involvement. You meet a guy, you can make eye contact, you kiss him, that's it. That's a poor expectation for sex, right? Ladies, you know, like, you've got to work a little harder. The, the kiss, a kiss or one point of sexual contact means you marry that guy. That means no woman is allowed to be promiscuous, well not promiscuous, to have multiple sexual partners. See, it's ingrained, I can't even help it. It's Freudian. In those instances, we think those women who can't be sexually active, and the harm of that is, if they don't feel empowered to do that, they won't do things like buy the pill. They won't do things like force a man to put on a condom when she has sex with them because he, she doesn't think her life choices are legitimate because Sleeping Beauty told her so. I don't think that women are that stupid, but they shouldn't be allowed, shouldn't be forced to think things like that. Third, fourthly, that anyone who is short or fat or ugly is not good in bed, a la the dwarves in the seven, whatever, Snow White. That particular paradigm is bad. A lot of short, ugly men are very good in bed. <laughs> Finally, Beauty and the Beast. We think in those instances it is fallacious to tell a woman that you can change a man just by living in his house, doing his housework, and like, whatever the point of that story is, and change him from being the masculine, rogue being he is into something that you want. You shouldn't have to seek to change the identity of the person you're with sexually. Those paradigms are rammed down children's throat to make them think that relationships are combative essentially or easy on the other end of the spectrum. That's bad in and of itself. Madam Speaker, they themselves were living in a fairy tale. We beg to propose. <laughs> I don't know where the fuck Steph went to school, but like, I didn't only read fairy tales. In school, I read things like Middlesex, which discussed gender norms. I like was exposed to a plurality, plurality of like, views, which allowed me to critically contrast and make up my own mind. That was the point of school. It allowed me to decide my own opinion. It allowed me to be exposed to multiple views. Just because I read a fairy tale, I don't necessarily hold misogynistic views about women. That is for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, like, you discount the ability of kids and teachers to come to their own understanding. And while doing this, what you do is you enforce this bullshit down their throats and you deny them their ability to be critical. I have three points. Will these measures break tolerance in schools? Two, what will it be the effect on children who are subjected to this shit? Three, what will be the effect of the backlash, especially on children within conservative communities? Okay, before I get into that, three points of rebuttal. One, this thing about sex, I go back to my opening, it's about like contrasting views. And like, just because you're exposed to, you know, one thing out of a multitude of things, doesn't mean you're necessarily going to develop those opinions. The thing is, like, if you're exposed to multiple, multiple views, you can come to that critical thing. What you allow under your model is only one view to be enforced. So you don't, like, allow even these novels or these, like, images which you, which you cry out bad to be even discussed as, like, negative things. You disallow that discussion and you enforce this thing upon children where they aren't critical. Okay, and when we talk about notions of sex, I'm going to talk about how this has much larger effects, especially on children who, who have parents and who would react to this kind of stuff. Second point about primary school. 
I'm kids being stupid. No, because what happens is you create a worrying discord with reality. Because when you go to school and there are no gender norms, but you go back home and your parents are a man and a woman and they carry out separate roles because they safely identify with them, or even if the child safely identifies them, what you do is create self-doubt. And I'm going to touch on this in my substantive point. Third point, are gender norms harmful? Yeah, there are instances where they can be harmful. But for a lot of people, they really say things which can be really positive and beneficial. No, thank you. What we see is, like, we, the policy, our policy which we propose is about tolerance and a multiplicity of views. So if you want to identify as a male who enjoys trucks, or if you want to identify as a male who wears dresses, it's okay. We tolerate that. No, thank you. So, like, the, the plurality is obliterated by your model because you don't get those choices. Okay, on to my substantive points. One, does this free children from strictures that you want to talk about? No, because it denies people who identify with current gender norms the ability to feel safe and secure within them, i.e. the boy who identifies with boy activities or the girl who does girl activities, the kind of stuff which you like characterize, characterize as completely evil. So what they do is the school actively pushes children away from their own self-actualization. I'll take you in a minute, step. What, like, what feels comfortable is denied. Like their, friend, their friends are moved away from them. Their ability to engage in the activities and the things they want is completely denied. And we think in terms of actual harms to children, this is much greater. Yes, Steph. How many children or five-year-olds are reading Simone de Beauvoir's Theory of Sexuality or watching Disney? <laughs> but like, how many children are just exposed to these negative views? And how many children have denied the abilities for teachers to critically discuss them with them? Like, the thing is, you need to give them a wide range of exposure, whether it is like Beauvoir, or if they can't handle that, you know, the gay penguins or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you have the plurality of views, okay? Like, not all of these stories are necessarily evil, and you can, like, convey this through, like, showing them multiple ones, instead of just giving them one view. Okay, back to my argument. What are the consequences of denying, like, putting these strictures upon people? One, you create more intolerance because like more people are forced out of what they think is okay. Like the people who previously identified and felt safe with certain norms no longer do that. So the actual like sheer number of people forced out of their comfort zone is increased. One, the cost of this, and you've got like this instability, instability which affects the ability of schools to effectively integrate children into society. So why the model of tolerance is much better? One, you allow choice and two, you respect the ability of people to feel safe. On to my second point about self-questioning and discord. Like the reality of these individuals is that like they have heterosexual parents. This is the majority of these individuals. They watch TV shows where certain norms are carried out. They have friends like who abide by these certain norms. When you start enforcing these kind of things upon them, what you do is you create no thank you an internal discord. You reflect the reality which is not in line with theirs. The thing is, when you do this to the majority of children, it's harmful because it like provokes questioning and self-denial. This isn't the kind of stuff that we want to put into you know, primary schoolers because um, like they're in like a developmental stage, which is very important. Okay, third point. This is about the backlash in communities. What you see is an enforcement. No, thank you, sir. You see an enforcement of a certain worldview, which isn't in line with a lot of people. The thing is. I feel greatly uneasy about that kind of stuff, and it's most likely that deeply conservative people in the sense of Pakenham or wherever they live like, um, would be incredibly uneasy with it, but not only would they feel uneasy but go along with it, they'd actively like, go against it. So what does this mean for the gay kids? It means that like, even though like, their parents would have been against them being gay, or like, you know, taking up any other role that like, doesn't you know, go into normalised masculinity, what you see now is that they're fighting against what their school is doing, so like, the definition of masculinity and the strictures placed upon them become much greater and much greater to escape. This is really damaging when we talk about the children that you want to protect. Ladies and gentlemen, this idea is scary. One, because it denies children the agency that they need to identify safely with whoever they want to be. We promote tolerance, <coughs> we promote respect, and we promote a plurality of views. Thank you. Like representing the unmarried woman, and we think that that is fundamentally negative. Under our model, 
what you got is that this can't exist under our law, right? Because Hansel will be a raging homosexual who wouldn't go anywhere the fuck near this large gingerbread house for fear of the carbs which existed within that. <laughs> that is fundamentally the benefit which exists under our model in undermining everything except for these equally insidious norms which we're promoting about homosexuality. We think when this debate is done with three gay men and three women, it's perfectly fine to perpetuate that type of norm because we're really accepting enough community anyway. I think I might be contradicting myself. Anyhow, <laughs> questions in today's debate. Firstly, what is the role of schools in this type of scenario? And then secondly, which policy creates a more liberal society broadly? The second one's the only one which matters because I haven't structured my speech very well at all. But ultimately, what we told you from the very start of today's debate is that whether we like it or not, schools will automatically guide people towards their identities. Schools will always exist throughout that time when people are naturally being guided towards their sense of selfhood, when they're making friends, when they are young and when their identity is in formation. Thus we said that there always exist these insidious influences which means that people aren't able to make these free choices which the negative team apparently want to point to. Which mean that people are never able to exist in this utopian society whereby they can make all these perfectly rational free choices without being subject to the horrific types of norms and gender stereotypes that exist. That was the very real problem which we wanted to deal with at Affirmative. The line which has been towed by the negative throughout the entirety of today's debate was simply not dealing with the fact that from the get-go that doesn't exist. That from the very start that choice which they wanted to predicate their entire case on simply does not exist. We think that's problematic. We think that schools particularly have a role in these types of things because of the fact that they automatically are going to have to play some sort of role in forming this identity. We said why not make that a proactive response. They gave us no reason whatsoever. So we think that our policy ultimately does create a far more liberal society for five reasons. I'm going to go through each one of these systematically. First, on the issue of choice. And Dan said that we're cutting choice off. And we think that's ironic, given that his argument for our model was that when you leave school, you're easily able to make your own choice, and that this, these schools don't exist in a vacuum, and you can make choice throughout a whole range of other factors in society. We think that if that is really what Dan believed, then why giving them an entirety of options which exist in school is insufficient? We never heard a response to that question. We think that secondly, what we're actually doing under our proposal is removing that insidious influence where patriarchal norms guide the individual's identity formation. We think what we're doing is not starting from a level playing field and thus needing to adapt to that. That's what we've always been willing to stand for on our side of the house. So then Dan brought up the idea that like, probably some backlash will exist. And under this same line of argumentation that I just put forward, we would say that for the same reason that we stand by things like affirmative action for politicians or affirmative action for women in business, we stand by this model we, because we think that there are systematic impingements which mean that they are fundamentally unable to make that choice with the free capacity that these guys want to claim exists. We think that that argument which Dan wanted to propose would have flown like perfectly fine in the civil rights movement, right? The argument that backlash is strong enough to say that society doesn't want something. We would say that at a certain point, when these free and individual rights do not exist, we have a responsibility to intervene regardless of what society thinks. Yes, Dan? You are not giving people free and individual rights. You are forcing a particular subverted gender role down people's throats. Please deal with that. Well, we think that what we are doing currently is responding to the, to the gender role which is already currently being rammed down their throats, right? Yes, we are doing it more openly, but that does not mean that we are necessarily doing it to any more insidious or worse extent. We think in any capacity, it makes it easier to see and it makes it something which can actually be taught more reasonably. We're happy with that. Anyway, thirdly, we told you that the views that these guys um, already oppose, like, are happy with currently discriminate in a heteronormative manner. So we're working to counteract these societal norms, right? And that's what we said all throughout the entirety of today's debate. And it is not sufficient to simply say that you're cutting off choice, particularly when the first speaker for the negative team said that these schools don't exist in a vacuum and there's plenty of other ways in which you can be exposed to these types of things. We think particularly when it brings out examples of, like, the gay penguin. That's exactly something which we're happy to have more exposure to on our side of the house. We don't see how that ever fell to you, to you guys. But then fourthly, the reason why we think we're very happy to, even if we were undermining this choice that these guys want to say exists, the reason that we would even be happy to do that if we were, was the material which Steph brought you, which never got responded to, right? That this choice fundamentally impinges on other people's rights, so that even if you want to infringe on a, on a certain number of people's choice, we are totally fine with that, given the like, society-wide ramifications which stem from that. 
But then fifthly, we would say that under their proposal, and under both proposals I suppose, a certain mutual exclusivity does exist, whereby we can't teach each perfectly. We think that if we were to teach both policies, we think ultimately what would result is one whereby their proposal is still seen as the norm, ours is still seen as the other proposal, whereby it still maintains the same position in society where it is marginalised. We don't think that regardless of the choice that they want to point to and claim exists, we don't think that's ever fair, we don't think it's ever going to create an equitable society. We're very happy to propose. <laughs>
shit position that that kid is in under the paradigm that you guys despise, right? So you haven't fixed that problem. You've just shifted it onto someone else. So, are children really sponges and stupid, like Kelly said? She said, well, they're going to believe whatever we tell them. Firstly, we told you that it's absolutely not true because Kelly has agreed that the rest of the world already has these influences. So what does that mean? They're going to go to school, but then they're going to go, to go home to their parents, their TVs, their Disney videos and see that, right? right? So they're not stupid enough to just soak everything in, which is why we think you have to actually respect that and give them the choice and give them material from both sides rather than trying to pretend that one doesn't exist and just blindly hope that they don't see it in the real world. We don't think that works. But then secondly, we told you that there's going to be a huge amount of backlash. And all we got in response to our exceptional material about backlash was, we don't care about backlash. Newsflash, guys, the very people you want to help are the people who are most ingrained in the system. Those people didn't become most ingrained in that patriarchal system for no reason. They became most ingrained because their cultural systems and their familial systems tell them that that is what is right. And what will those systems do when they find out that their kids' state primary school is shoving this kind of crap down their throats? They will become even more extreme, which means that those kids don't get the view that you want. So we think that that backlash is very, very important. Secondly, like I said, we don't think you get acceptance because this only shifts the kids who like mainstream things to being in the spotlight. It only shifts the burden of that being wrong to those people. Like, I'm a woman and I like baking, right? And I used to be a fairy, so I live in my own fairy tale, if you will. But you know what? I've got an arts degree and a law degree and I'm financially independent and I think I'm relatively sexually liberated. I'm doing fine. <laughs> it works. Lastly, let's talk about consent. Because Kelly said the problem is these guys don't get to opt in and the kids who are tomboys get bullied. We'd say you don't get to opt in sometimes to what you like. You just like it. So if you like baking, it's not fair that you then get bullied because that's traditionally female, right? We think that just like you don't get to opt in to whether you're a tomboy or not, you don't get to opt in to what you're good at. We're not happy to have that burden shifted. I didn't really get to talk about ladies, but that's okay. I've pretty much covered it. We think if you want to be a damsel in distress, go right ahead. It's not true that women don't have the capacity to make that choice. To any extent that it is, we think having a balance is the best way to go about it. You're not going to have a better society if you don't let kids choose. We're very